think we can get started. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Vogel. I'm one of the conference organizers along with Sam Bossi. Um, I want to thank all of you all for coming and presenting your amazing work, uh, engaging and stimulating if somewhat distant conversation. Um, and I also want to take a quick moment to thank some of the people who have kept Sam and me from allowing this event to descend into disarray. Um, one of those people is our own Michelle Galvez, who's been running the show today, um, and the other is Siga's Dustin Marshall, who has graciously shared his uh, technological savvy with us. Um, I'm also grateful to our team of UCSD graduate students who have been keeping the breakout rooms humming without a hiccup throughout the day. So um, I'm super excited about today's keynote event, uh, in which we're taking advantage of this virtual format to bring people together people who aren't just geographically disparate, but also come from different disciplines. We'll have a half hour lecture by anthropologist Jim Ferguson, followed by a half hour conversation uh, with three economists who teach in the business school, politics department, and economics department. So they're all economists, but you know, they teach in different places. So I'm going to count that as interdisciplinary as well. Um, so let me start by telling you about the anthropologist, and I'll just say a few words about the economists who many of you already know. So uh, Jim Ferguson is the Susan S. and William H. Hindle Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences and Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford. Um, his research has focused on Southern Africa and has dealt with a range of topics, uh, including rural urban migration, uh, changing claims to property and wealth, and the politics of development, which he, unlike some of us, tends to put in quotes. So he's especially interested in how concepts like development in quotes affect people's lives, and that interest goes all the way back to his well-known 1990 book on development projects in Lesotho uh, called The Anti-Politics Machine. His recent, work, his recent work, which we'll hear more about in a bit, has focused on the cash transfer and universal basic income programs that many of us have here have studied and advocated. Uh, but unlike the typical development economist, Jim tries to understand these transfer programs within what he calls the politics of distribution. So he asks how these programs rethink who deserves what and why, right? Um, his 2015 book, Give a Man a Fish, deals with these issues as they relate to cash transfer programs, but I know he's continued to work on these issues and I'm, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about them today. So after Jim's talk, we're going to subject him to a conversation with economists, which is a lousy way to thank someone, but uh, I think it'll at least uh, be with some of the kindest and most interesting economists I know, um, so there, there's that. Um, I'd like to get I'd like to get out of the way uh, after I finish talking right now. So let me quickly introduce you to those other panelists, and then you won't hear from me again. So our moderator for the second part of the event is going to be Paul Niehaus, who's an associate professor of economics here at UCSD. Paul has written extensively on the effects of cash and work-based programs for the poor, as well as the political economy surrounding them. And maybe more importantly for today's conversation, he co-founded the NGO Give Directly, which has distributed hundreds of millions of dollars in direct cash transfers to the poor, mostly in Africa, uh, mostly in East Africa, sorry. Um, as it happens, yesterday was Paul's birthday, um, and I'm very sad that we can't all share a giant birthday cake in his honor. Um, so Paul's going to lead a conversation with Jim and our two panelists, uh, who have graciously joined us despite the absence of cake, and I'm so, so pleased they could be here. Um, the first is Tavneet Suri, who is the Lewis E. Seeley Professor of Applied Economics at MIT. Tavneet has written on a range of topics in African development, uh, including technology and agriculture, mobile money, and most recently, universal basic income in a project that's joined with Paul. I feel it's uh, noteworthy for today's event that Tavneet is Kenyan, and also that she's the driving force behind VoxDev, a website that's making development economics research more accessible to uh, inquiring minds from various fields. Um, and the second panelist is Leonard Wanchekon, who's a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton. It's a little hard to summarize Leonard, who is prolific and wide ranging and has led a life that I guess I would say uh, exposes the deficiencies of our life cycle models. So he's gone from a leading student activist in his native Benin uh, to a leading researcher on the electoral politics and the historical roots of development in Africa uh, to a leader in harnessing the talent of young African economists in his new uh, African School of Economics. Um, so we have a, 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 a range of, uh, of experts um, uh, on uh, transfer programs, on, uh, on politics, uh, on, various, uh, on various parts of Africa. Um, and all said, we have four brilliant scholars with us here today, and I'm just so excited to learn from them. Um, with that said, I'm going to get out of the way for the rest of the, for the, rest of the session, um, and I'll pass the floor over to you, Jim. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the organizers um, for this very generous and wonderfully cross-disciplinary invitation. Um, 
especially uh, you, Tom, and, and Paul and Niehaus. Um, my recent work, which Tom briefly alluded to, has involved tracing some new developments in what I call the politics of distribution, especially with respect to some increase to the increasing use of cash transfers to address issues of poverty and inequality in southern Africa and beyond. These are topics on which economists rightly claim expertise and speaking before this audience, I am acutely aware that I lack the economics training that would allow me to properly address a host of technical and practical questions concerning the economic and developmental effectiveness of these programs. But that is not really my aim here, nor will I advocate for one policy path versus another as one might in a political or policy context. Instead, I will take a few moments to sketch a perspective, not on cash transfers, but on the larger distributional context within which they have lately become so important. In doing so, I will be hoping to raise questions rather than claiming to have found the answers to them. By the politics of distribution, I mean most simply the political question of who gets what and why. And the claim I wish to make here is that labor and citizenship, which have long been the anchors for our thinking about these questions of distribution, no longer seem to provide an adequate way of answering them. Both in my own area of specialization, Southern Africa, and across the global South and beyond, the old answers leave out huge populations. Growing masses of unemployed and underemployed and the rapid expansion of precarious and so-called informal livelihoods challenge the idea of universal inclusion through integration into a stable formal sector workforce. Meanwhile, an increasingly mobile global population leaves growing numbers all over the world undocumented and thus lacking citizenship rights in their places of work and residence. But at the same time, I argue, emergent new forms of distributive politics show the importance of different kinds of distributive claims in these times. Claims based on neither labor nor citizenship, but on what we might call in the broadest sense, ownership on the one hand, and what I term presence on the other. I will explain these rather cryptic terms shortly. But let me start by reviewing very briefly those long established distributive ideals focused around labor and citizenship. With respect to the labor side of the story, all across the world, a kind of meta narrative of economic progress promised as a culmination of the development process, the universalization of waged or salaried employment. A modern society was a society of jobs and job holders. That this promise has so often ended up a broken one does not seem to diminish its attraction, as is clear in the rhetorical ap appeals of politicians the world over. Jobs, jobs, jobs. But the limited ability to think beyond the promised land of jobs for all afflicts not only politicians, but scholars as well. Indeed, the proper job has served for so long as a presumed norm or telos of development that we are too often left with a stunted and reactive set of categories and concepts for thinking about all the other ways in which people make their way in the world. This is perhaps why discussions of so-called precarity often rely on residual categories of analysis, unemployment, informal economy, non-standard employment, insecurity, in, sorry, instability, insecurity, categories that render everything outside the world of jobs a kind of negative space defined by that which it is not. There was a powerful vision implicit in the idea of an emerging developed world in which paid labor might provide the basis both of a stable livelihood and of a kind of social membership or incorporation for all. 
as people left their pre-industrial rural agricultural or pastoral livelihoods in such a conception, they would be fitted into the modern new social order precisely by having a job, that enchanted object that still provides the normal answer to the question, so what do you do? A set of gendered expectations about the breadwinner and the family, the organization of time and space, the role of formal education, respectability and virtue, and contribution to the nation were all rolled up into this notion of the proper job. Today, as that imagined universality gradually recedes in the rearview mirror, its once dominant status begins to become visible to us as distinctive, perhaps even strange. As Guy Standing once memorably put it, the 20th century in retrospect now appears as what he called the century of laboring man, a time when the lifeway of what had been a small fraction of the population, the stabilized urban working class, became quite suddenly and somehow for many quite convincingly projected as the future of all. And if the century of laboring man is, as Standing argues, at an end, it is not because stable waged and salaried labor is disappearing in any absolute sense, but because it is losing its plausibility as the universal solution, the obvious telos of a worldwide developmental pro process. Whether due to the globalization of supply chains and labor markets that undercuts established working classes, the persistent structural unemployment and casualization induced by neoliberal restructuring and so-called austerity, or the recent and looming technological developments that threaten to eliminate or drastically reduce whole categories of paid labor, the old transition story no longer convinces. In the political domain, the nation state has long provided the same sort of anchor of stability that the proper job was supposed to offer in the economic. A legally authorized political membership, in theory at least, underpinned a set of explicit and universal rights and obligations. And this too helped provide the answer to that central question of distributive politics. Who gets what and why? If income in labor terms was seen as a reward for work, there always remained the question of all those who did not in those terms work, that is those unable to work or whose work was not paid. Society being composed not of individuals but of domestic groups, often understood in highly idealized terms as families, dependence was part of the distributive story. In this old story, children, old people, and often reproductive women as well, were styled as legitimate dependents, dependent upon the worker, the so-called breadwinner, the head of household. But there were also others unable to work due to disability, for instance, or to the unemployment produced by the unpredictable vacillations of the business cycle. And here, the nation state stepped into the breach, especially in the form of so-called welfare states that where they existed offered a different kind of legitimate dependence in the form of direct social payments to the poor and the so-called safety net. Social assistance, perhaps the purest instance of direct state intervention into distributive outcomes, here was pegged directly to the two anchors of distributive politics I have identified. First, it was generally available not to workers, but specifically to dependents children, the elderly, the disabled, the reproductive woman, a kind of photographic negative of the laboring man, that so-called breadwinner, able-bodied worker. And it was available, again, nearly always, only to citizens, as a kind of solidarity appropriately extended only to those within the charmed circle of national membership. My argument here, to put it in a highly condensed form, is that this whole way of thinking about distribution has less and less purchase today, both in Southern Africa and in much of the rest of the world, as increasing proportions of people fall out of both the labor and the citizenship frames of inclusion. <laughs> 
These include the surging new urban masses who don't gain their livelihoods either from working the land, they are no longer peasants, or by selling their labor, they cannot become workers, but instead pursue what I have termed distributive livelihoods. That is livelihoods that depend not on selling one's labor, but on accessing the income streams of others via social or political claims. Those falling out of the frame also include those who, with or without access to paid labor, are unable to access citizenship-based forms of distribution, including social protection, due to migration and the associated lack of documents. So-called illegals, who in Southern California as elsewhere, comprise, I'm sorry, in Southern Africa as elsewhere, comprise an increasingly large share of the poor but who as residents, but not citizens, lack political rights and distributive entitlements alike. Given these hard to ignore gaps in the world's systems of distributive allocation, I wish to pose the question of what other grounds beyond claims rooted in labor or citizenship, what other grounds might be available to support new sorts of distributive claims? What new ways are emerging for answering the questions, who gets what and why? Here, I point to two broad areas of emergence. One, claims of what I call ownership, I treated in my book, Give a Man a Fish in 2015. The other involving the claims of what I call presence is the subject of another small book coming out just this next week titled Presence and Social Obligation. With respect to what I'm calling ownership, I begin by observing that even those who are partly or wholly excluded from the world of productive labor may still make strong distributive claims by styling themselves as members of a collectivity understood as a rightful or ultimate sort of owner. Marxism, with its labor theory of value and its fundamental understanding of the oppressed as workers, has always struggled with the politics of the non-worker. But I suggest in Give a Man a Fish that we are heir to a rich set of alternative left traditions that may have more to offer to those excluded from a role in the production system. The anarcho-communist Peter Kropotkin, for instance, always insisted on starting with universal claims of distribution and a notion of distributive justice ultimately rooted in societal membership and not just labor. Where does our vast wealth come from? Why are we so much more productive than our great grandparents? We are not better people than they were. We certainly do not work harder. Instead, we're able to produce vast riches they could not have dreamt of, only thanks to a vast worldwide industrial apparatus of production. An apparatus built up through generations of work, sacrifice, and invention across centuries and even millennia of human history in a process that generated massive suffering for millions all across the globe. And to whom does this vast wealth producing apparatus really belong? Surely not only to the corporate stockholders who now outrageously claim to own it outright, but to the descendants of all those who worked and imagined and suffered and bled to create it. In short, to all of us. The whole system of production in this conception must be regarded as a collective inheritance. And from this universal claim of common ownership, Kropotkin derives a universal distributive claim. Surely, at least some portion of the entire output must be due to each and every one of the rightful owners of the apparatus of production. Everyone, that is, must receive a share. Note that it is not the worker as worker whose claims are prioritized here, but the member of society, the inheritor of a great common estate 
in which each and every one of us has a share. It is not just labor that founds that inheritance in this view, but also things like suffering, bloodshed, ingenuity, and shared experience. It is therefore the entire society that is the source of value. And it is all members of that society, and not only those currently employed as workers, who as inheritors and co-owners of the whole are entitled to a rightful share of society's proceeds. Such arguments I have suggested are not only of academic interest. As I show in Give a Man a Fish, remarkably similar arguments have been put forward by advocates for Namibia's basic, in some in basic income grant coalition who propose that each and every Namibian should be entitled to a monthly cash payment precisely because they, as the nation's citizens, are the real owners of the country and its mineral wealth, and therefore ought, as they say, to share in the country's wealth. Receipt of a modest monthly state payment in these arguments is rendered simply as the receipt of a share that is properly due to an owner. The most basic citizenship right is thus understood not as the right to vote, but as the right to partake in the wealth of the nation. Direct grants from the state in this understanding need not bring with them the shame or stigma of receiving charity or getting a handout. In receiving a rightful share, Namibian citizens in this conception are simply partaking in the wealth that rightly belongs to the whole nation. And in doing so, they, as rightful co-owners of that wealth, are not receiving a gift or even being offered help. They are claiming what is already rightfully their own, a rightful share. But such arguments about shares and sharing, however powerful, are founded upon their own form of exclusion, insofar as they are based upon membership in a bounded collectivity, the nation institutionally represented by the state. And this is linked to the second set of problems I identified at the start. In a highly mobile world, many of the poorest members of many national populations today, not least in Southern Africa, are those who lack most completely the protections offered by the state since they are non-citizens. This raises a key question. On what basis other than shared national membership might a distributive obligation, an obligation to share, rest? I try to begin to address this question in that new book I, I mentioned via an argument about what I call presence. And here I very briefly summarize one part of that argument. Reviewing the anthropological literatures on sharing, I find something quite general about the obligation to share. In the most basic possible terms, I observe that we find such an obligation specifically when the person whose claim to a share might or might not be honored is both one of us, what I refer to as the attribute of membership, and here among us, what I call the attribute of presence. So the, the responsibility, the, the obligation is strongest where we're dealing with someone who is one of us, a member, and here among us, someone who is present. And my observation here is that one of these attributes without the other may have some force, but never the full force that comes with both membership and presence. In the modern West, we are familiar with the idea that at least some minimal obligations are owed toward fellow members of, as we say, our own society. That is, those who are both co-members of the abstract membership set that is the nation and co-present in the geographical space we call a country. Toward those who are in this way both members, one of us, and present here among us, the fact of a certain kind of social obligation is clear, even if the specific forms it should take are not. 
Indeed, we sometimes regard these obligations to be of a similar kind, if of less intensity and moral depth, as those owed to members of our families. In contrast to such relatively strong obligation, we may note the weakness both of presence without membership, which yields only such fairly feeble forms of obligation toward physically proximate non-nationals as asylum proceedings, and of membership without presence, as when membership in humanity functioning as a kind of analogical extension of the nation is urgently asserted for distant and foreign others. This distinction between criteria of membership and those of presence is, I think, clarifying. But a quick turn to Southern Africa reveals how these two principles may be brought together in a more dynamic way than we in the West are used to, as presence and membership there often sit in a much more fluid relationship. In European societies, blood and soil have long served as principles of exclusion, such that one may be expelled or excluded either for having the wrong descent or for having been born in the wrong place. But Southern African societies are in the long durée, if not always at present, historically disinclined to kick out foreigners and highly sophisticated at deriving means for incorporating them as what anthropologists of Africa call wealth in people. And in the service of securing such wealth, they have traditionally had a more supple and lively conception of how belonging may be linked to both territory, including soil, and bodily substances, including blood. Over time, foreigners have often been held to become durably attached to a place through things like labor as their sweat mingles with the soil and suffering as shared suffering and spilled blood creates a spiritual unity rooted in the lived experience of co-dwelling. Here it is not juridical citizenship that is at issue, where were you born, who are your parents, but the material entailments of shared physical presence, suffering through the same drought, sweating into the same soil. Being here in this long political tradition counts for a lot. And over time, such physical presence can actually become both a kind of membership and an identity of substance. A neighbor is therefore a position from which strong claims can emerge. A gifted young Zambian ethnographer, Patience Mususa, has recently given a fine example of this from her research in the Copper Belt. Having purchased for her own use a fixer-upper house in an urban neighborhood of Luantia, Mususa was soon approached by a neighborhood man who asked if he and his family might move into a spare room at the back of her property on the understanding that his wife would in exchange serve as a domestic worker. The ethnographer politely declined and explained that she did not need a domestic worker and did not intend to rent out the room. But when she took possession of the house a few weeks later, she found that the family had simply moved in. Her outrage was quickly checked though by the reactions of her neighbors who asked her just what then she did intend to do with that room. In their eyes, she realized, and I quote, to have an unoccupied building would have been too selfish indeed. And she reluctantly let the family stay. In a similar incident, she reported finding one day upon her return home from work, two strange women helping themselves to some vegetables she had planted in her back garden. Unperturbed, the women cheerfully shouted, we're just stealing some vegetables from your garden. Surely, the ethnographer reflected, living alone, I could not have eaten all the vegetables in the garden. Such helpings, as she calls them, were not only common, they were in a real way, in her terms, deemed acceptable. As Thomas Vidlock has rightly insisted, among the most important modalities of sharing must be reckoned the practice of as he puts it, 
refraining from interfering with someone who is about to take something. This is the logic of what anthropologists call demand sharing. And the rightfulness of the share is here rooted precisely in the simple presence of adjacency, the fact of being here, the status of being a neighbor. Yet the power of this social and political logic of presence, I suggest, remains significantly underanalyzed. Even as what I have called the membership principle, one of us, is both explicitly acknowledged in law as citizenship and endlessly subject to critical analysis as the politics of identity. The presence principle here among us has largely remained at the level of common sense. We have not yet fully realized either how central it is to enabling actual social obligations or how richly constructed is the apparently self-evident condition of being present of being here. What might be gained then from a conceptual and political reworking of the idea of presence as the basis for a modern day politics of sharing? Answering this question poses the challenge of moving from the sort of literal face-to-face -face presence that we see in that Copper Belt neighborhood to a reworked and scaled up concept more suitable to modern distributive politics. An obligation to share is most readily grasped, I think, at the level, the micro level of personal interaction. And we have a hard time imagining how it might be applied to larger scales. But why is this? And why do we so easily imagine membership in contrast as capable of being scaled up to hundreds of millions? as in the idea of national citizenship, uniting people in a way that is analogous to membership in a family. The task here, as I see it, is to develop a better sense of what a similarly scaled up conception of presence might look like, and to identify modes of distributive politics that might be able to harness the claims of presence to press for specific distributive claims. Ways of insisting that the fact of being here citizen or not, must be made to have more bearing on the old question of who gets what and why. In conclusion, let me emphasize that I acknowledge that the modes of making distributive claims that I have discussed here remain marginal to a world where the old constructs of labor and citizenship continue to dominate the conceptual landscape of distributive politics. But I would also insist that the forms of distribution that I have identified must be understood as emergent realities rather than utopian proposals. Universal payments based on the idea of popular ownership, for instance, are not unknown. The Alaska Permanent Fund, for instance, makes all legal residents of Alaska shareholders in a portion of the wealth produced by oil production there. And residents receive an annual dividend check based not on their participation in production, but their legal status as state residents, that is, as co-owners. New social protection programs in several countries also link state-owned mineral resources directly to social entitlements, such as pensions and childcare grants. More broadly, the cash transfer schemes that have proliferated all across the global south in recent years are, it is true, still mostly conceived in a depoliticized social assistance frame. But in the book, I suggest drawing on Southern African experience that they may also be helping to lay the groundwork for new sorts of distributive politics that might help to move social payments away from the old grounds of charity and help for the helpless and toward new conceptions that move in the direction of the rightful share. As for presence, here too, my approach is to track real developments on the ground, not to propose some imaginary pie in the sky. In fact, the modern politics of state service delivery revealed the very real power of social claims based on presence already today. As Partha Chatterjee once pointed out, 
practical imperatives of governance often mean that legal certainties of citizenship and rights give way to other logics entailed in the day-to-day -day management and administration of populations, which as he puts it, involves less the representation of citizens than the government of what he calls denizens. Which children should attend school? Who gets vaccinated for measles? Who gets toilets? The answers often proceed not according to a logic of right, but of practicality. Well, do we want undocumented kids not to be in school? What would they do then and with what consequences? Do we really want to exclude a huge chunk of the population from our vaccination campaigns? Not legal abstractions, but root sociological and immunological facts give the answers to such questions. Certain services must, for practical as much as ethical reasons, be extended not to whoever is an authorized member, but to whoever is here. And all over the world, new forms of political assertion and pragmatic accommodation draw their force not from the claims of citizenship, but those of presence. The problems of government that they present involve less adjudicating the rights belonging to members than coping with the material demands of what we might term adjacency. Finally, I want to emphasize that it is not a matter of whether or not we should have new modes of distribution. The great and growing masses of people who lack both access to land and regular wage labor and the protections of legal citizenship are not going to meekly curl up in a corner and die. They will press their distributive claims using whatever channels and levers are available to them. If the claims of labor and citizenship are not available to them, they will find other grounds for making distributive claims. And we will have to come to terms with new ways of thinking and new sorts of arguments. Arguments that will disrupt our long established ways of answering that old question, who gets what and why? Thank you. James, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for um, summarizing what I know has been many years of work in 30 minutes and in a format that's uh, new for us and, and refreshing, I think, to have a break from the PowerPoint slides. So um, we really appreciate it. Appreciate your um, talk. Yes, yes. We're going to move now into um, a time of discussion with Leonard and with Tavneet. And um, the way we'll do that is um, I have some uh, questions I'll pose to, uh, to specific people on the panel but then invite everybody else to respond as well and to uh, you know, really hope, hopefully make it as much of a discussion as possible. Um, and so we'll do some of those. And then um, at the end, we'll also have time for questions from the audience. And so as, uh, as these guests are discussing, if you'd like to start putting those in chat, I'll keep an eye on those. Um, Leonard, if I could start with you. Um, you're, uh, we're, we're so happy to have you here. You're a longtime observer. Um, of an, an analyst of political economy in Africa, not to mention a participant, as Tom said in introducing you. Um, and you also helped to lead the Afrobarometer Network, um, which gives us a systematic sense of um, sort of, a, of how opinions are trending in a bunch of countries. And so I would love it if you could open our discussion with some general reflections um, on what uh, James has shared here. As you look across the landscape in Africa, where do you see elements of a new politics of distribution um, as James has described, emerging. Um, where do you see headwinds? Where do you see reactionary tendencies in the opposite direction? Thank, thank you very much. So I really uh, enjoyed um, um, the lecture and uh, I'm not going to summarize the key points uh, since I have just a short time. I will um, basically characterize the exercise as um, extremely thoughtful and uh, empirically relevant, but then I feel like it's too narrowly focused on jobs, income, and also, it's a bit normative and not enough kind of um, 
about, but not enough about the politics, the positive politics of redistribution. Um, so it, it's a very strange that an economist will criticize an anthropologist of being too narrow, but uh, but I, I, yeah, I, I will, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not good, I, anyway, but, but that's, that's basically, that's basically what, what I think. So first of all, so I'm going to talk about the things that are clearly missing, um, you know, because, you know, I mean, again, I'm not going to repeat what I've been said earlier. So the first one is, you know, very, uh, the, the, the lecture alludes to the culture of redistribution, you know, with the example of uh, somebody who show up and, you know, want to sleep out, sleep over and somebody who actually, uh, you know, you know, steal, you know, uh, somebody's, uh, you know, uh, whatever. I, I, I think um, the key the key point to be made there is that there is a deep, long-standing culture of uh, redistribution within the family that cross across generation, which is extremely powerful. It's a powerful engine for poverty alleviation in rural communities. It's a powerful engine for social mobility. You know, for instance, you paying for the school fee of your nephew and being an inspiration for your for the kids of your neighbor. And, and I think very, very, very strong evidence that this culture is, is there and it's extremely important. And it doesn't have much to do with, um, I mean, yeah, I, I think I'm not going to frame it as if it's there is an issue of um, property rights, so, you know, and people just taking stuff from a neighbor, you know, I mean, it's, it's there is something deep obligation um, for redistribution would be, would be the family, which is something extremely, extremely powerful. Now, um, so, so the second point is that the focus on income and labor basically take away from what is a fundamental engine for redistribution, which is public goods, you know, education, roads, clinics, and housing, you know, public housing, you know, and in Cote d'Ivoire, in South Africa, in Nigeria, for instance, the most powerful engine for redistribution is public goods. I mean, it was alluded to a little bit later in terms of, you know, like for instance, vaccination and stuff. But I think, um, what I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's missing is the, this kind of focus on income redistribution and, 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 and labor and the role of the state in that process, as opposed to families, communities, but also public goods, you know, which is the most powerful, perhaps, engine for redistribution. And there is a massive evidence that, you know, this is what's happening. Unfortunately, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, you know, as James uh, said quite, like, quite well, you know, like uh, the structural adjustment program, for instance, kill this, um, I mean, kill, I mean, reduce, for instance, the role of states in providing public goods. And this led to, um, I'm not sure, a, de a decline, but at least in part, um, uh, you know, more inequality, I should say, in access to, 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 to public goods. Now, okay, so the other point that I think it's, uh, it's also important on the politics of redistribution, you know, um, what I think, as I said, it's, the presentation was very normative. It's about the right, but in fact, it's, I think I, sh I should talk more about how this right is implemented and the political distortions in the, the way the right, this right is, 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 is implemented. The fact, for instance, that, you know, uh, ethnicity, will give you more rights to education. The fact that if you are more likely to vote for a candidate, it gives you more rights to education than the rest. And, um, and uh, you know, and the fact that for instance, uh, allocation of roads, for instance, are distorted, uh, 
because of uh, you know political and ethnic affiliation. So I think the issue for redistribution is uh, is you know uh, lack of programmatic politics, and, and and this is in part due to the fact that um, political parties, for a wide range of reasons in Africa, has not evolved into programmatic parties. You know, like for instance. There's not a process through which, I mean, there is a limited process through which, for instance, um, political party run on education, run on human capital, run on road construction, you know, and as, oppo as opposed to just being very opportunistic in the way they, 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 they want to invest for in, you know, in education and, and also in income distribution. So I think I will give some room for this kind of rather positive um, dimension of, um, of, um, of, of, of redistribution that talks about not only the, the, the why or the who, but also the how, you know? So, and, um, and, and then one other point is state capacity, you know, because once a decision is made of who gets what, how do you get it implemented? Without, for instance, the, 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 this, I mean, assume that even like, um, uh, 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 you know, education and uh, public goods or inc even income redistribution scheme are allocated fairly, you know, that there are programmatic parties that decide to run on those issues and actually implement and, and decide to implement this policy. Then you are going to have leaky buckets, you know, you are going to have local bureaucrats, for instance, that is going to capture some of the fund. You are going to have, um, for instance, a um, lot of inefficiency uh, in terms of allocation because you know, people don't, might not know exactly. Uh, I mean, like there is no process through which, for instance, people who have the right to get this actually get it. You know? so, 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 so the issue of state capacity is central. It's central to the debate, and I think it's it's missing state capacity in the sense of the ability of the state to actually implement whichever policy has been decided, has been agreed on. You know, so 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 I think this is a very very important element. But then there is something about African culture that could be part of the solution that unfortunately are not used, which is participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, for instance, that have been shown. Um, you know, in Latin America and other places, for instance, to, to help reduce corruption, to help, uh, you know, um, basically implement a more kind of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, a, a, a more efficient, you know, uh, implementation of, uh, of, in, of, 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 you know, of income distribution, the, the distribution scheme and, um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and you know, I, I, will, I would like to see, for instance, many African democracies uh, at local level in particular have, a, have mechanism in place through which people can decide the what, and then will also be, um, I mean, through town hall meeting and other things like that, but also through some kind of popular and popular uh, involvement, participation in public management, for instance, and this can lead to a more efficient implementation of, um, of this. So, 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 so to, to, to summarize, I think this was a, a fantastic uh, exercise, but I think that it should give more weight to the, to the culture of redistribution that already exists which is not backward, which is actually forward, because it leads to a situation, for instance, where people like me coming from a very, very you know, modest family can benefit from investment by his, his, own, his or her uncle and, and, and move up. And then the second point is the, the fact that income and jobs, yes, but public goods of various form is critical for redistribution. I don't think it's more, this is a bit absence in the Marxian theory of redistribution, but I think um, it's, a, it's an important uh, point that should be, should be featured in this exercise. And the last two are the political distortions 
that play out in the way the rights that have been described can be implemented based on electoral incentives or based on ethnic affiliation and all. That's an important element, plus uh, state capacity, which when it's weak, can basically wipe out um, resources that should be used to actually implement uh, the right uh, that had been uh, you know, lay out and described. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leonard. Um, I'll just say personally that um, I think your comments highlight one of the reasons I was so excited about this conversation, which is this inescapable interplay between the positive and the normative considerations, which I think is something that we don't often get to do um, in our profession. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, James Tevnit, would either of you like to add or to respond? Oh, muted. <laughs> oh, I'm muted. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Um, I'll, I'll just take a couple minutes because I, I, don't, I don't really want to hear any more of my own voice. I want to hear whatever other people are thinking. Um, but I, I agree with, with most of what Leonard had to say, and I think that the points are very well taken. Um, I, in, the, in the book on presence um, that I referred to, I have a discussion of public goods, in fact. Uh, one of the interesting things, I think, is that although we, we think of public goods as goods delivered by state to the citizenry, in fact, you don't have to be a citizen to benefit from a lot of the most important kinds of public goods. If someone builds a road or puts in lighting or builds a, a, a clean water facility, it's often people who have no legal right to it at all who benefit from that because you, get, you benefit from, from those investments in, in infrastructure simply by living in that urban environment, whether or not you're supposed to be there. Um, and I, so I think that's actually an example of the, the kind of uh, ways that people can, can access distributions um, outside of, um, of the frames of citizenship. Um, and I completely agree also about the, the, the hazards of the distortion, as you called it, of, of rights that are meant to, to apply to everyone and the, and the limitations of state capacity. But I'll just say that's one of the reasons why I, I'm so interested in programs of cash transfer and particularly unconditional programs of cash transfer, which seem to me to be one of the state programs that, that can be most effectively implemented under conditions of limited state capacity and that can in fact uh, serve as an effective counter to, for instance, ethnic distortions and the distributions of goods. If you create a universal system of payment as, as they have done in South Africa and Namibia, for instance, that really is universal. I mean, everybody really does get their old age pension and everybody gets the same and it's on time. And uh, one, one of the few examples of, of government really uh, effectively delivering what's been promised. And so that's, that's part of the attraction for me. And I think maybe for, for Paul and, and Tavnit as well of, of these cash schemes is, is that they, they provide at least one way of responding to the kinds of concerns that Leonard highlighted here. Thanks, James. Maybe with that, we'll, we'll go to Tavnit. And Tavnit, if you want to say anything in response to you know, what's been discussed so far, please do. Um, but if you would, maybe yeah, also- Yeah, let me jump in, Paul, just on I think our lines between normative and positive are so clear for people and they're not um, Sure, go ahead. I think of politics as a way to get some of the normative questions people want to pose. What's fair, what's right? I think my version of fair, I'm sure, I would bet all is, is very different from yours, Paul. And my version of right is also probably very different than yours, right? I think a democratic political system is a way to aggregate those preferences on what you think is right and take the normative to the positive, right? I have people in who we think hold our versions of what's fair and right to make those decisions for us, right? And I think that's sort of naturally the way we we think about how to aggregate. Things. And so, you know, I think the role of politics and how you are fair and right is going to be really important, uh, especially in this discussion of, of UBI and, you know, universality of something basic or something else. Yeah, sorry, you can go back to your question, Paul. I just wanted to ask that. Just oh, that's gone. great. Okay. I think they mix over quite clearly, and I think of politics as perfect lines for us. Yes, yes. Yes, no, that's the. I that's don't think we're, we're kind of obsessed with it in an economic sense. I think we think it's just not our, we think it's a community decision, and that should vary by every community. They get to what they think is fair and right. 
let's um let's so let's build on that and let's talk about the basic income pilots. Um, you know, it's been one of the sort of the the centers of energy for these conversations about um, sort of a potential new politics of redistribution. And there are lots of pilots happening now around the world. Uh, James mentioned the one in Namibia. You and I are involved in one in Kenya. There are many others. Um, could you, you know, talk not not so much about the program evaluation of these, but really about the, the meaning of them? Sort of what should we be looking for in terms of, you know, both what happens in these pilots to the people that participate in them, but also, um, you know, the way the story of these pilots gets told and the way other people perceive them. What do you think is important or significant? Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I did mean to say this before. I've had a really bad internet day, even though I'm right next to MIT campus. I don't know what that says about it. But I apologize in advance. Uh, and if I'm cutting out, just let me know and I'll try and pause and, and restart. Um, so it's a good question, Paul, and please keep to, I, I wanna be conscious of time because you wanted to sort of keep a, a chunk of time. So I'll try and be brief, but please feel free to cut me off when I go to questions. Um, you know, like you said, there's a lot of pilots. I think the one thing I sort of see happen is there's a big distinction between universality and not. That is an enormous, enormous distinction. And I think that gets missed entirely. Um, you know, if I'm trying to target people versus not target, there's a big distinction between those things. And most things are not universal and are targeting. It's not even a random sample of universal, yet they're called universal. And I think that kind of pulls away the discussion for me from the piece that's most important. What does the piece of universality buy you that's different from something like, you know, a cash for the poor or a targeted welfare system or public goods that are targeted, right? Uh, maybe badly targeted <laughs> hometowns or whatever, but they're still targeted, right? And so I think in this conversation and in the conversation of the pilots, we're not, we're missing kind of key pieces that makes this quite different in terms of both the politics, the impacts and the economics, the, the normative questions of what's fair and what's right and what should be everybody's right to something. And I, I worry the pilots kind of are just cash transfer pilots and that's fine and that's good to do, but I don't think it actually arbitrates the question for me, which is about the universality. It's not about will giving people money help them. I think that we answered. Yeah. Do yeah. targeted things work for those people? We've answered that with tons of experiments. Right? We kind of know answers to that. We know about targeting public goods in some ways, right? Um, so unfortunately, I think we're still missing a really deep conversation about the universality piece in my books. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the pilots are not universal um, and it detracts because they're, they're reported as universal and then you kind of have to go work that out. So fortunately, I think in how we're thinking of them, I think we really need to be careful about whether this is a transfer just on a different population, a slightly different population here or there, or whether there's a component to thinking about universality and how do we think about that both conceptually, analytically, politically, you know, in all of those dimensions. Um, so I think that's my biggest kind of piece of both worry and missingness in the conversation, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And Tevnit, it's, it's been in and out a little bit, but I think that I, I at least have been able to make out what you're saying. I hope others have as well. So um, we're gonna we're gonna bear with it. So let me just ask you one thing specifically though about about the incentives because you know traditionally that's just like a centerpiece of economic analysis of any redistributive programming that there is you know potentially this trade off where if we move to a model like the one James has described where claims can be based not on labor um, then the incentive for labor is lower you know and that trade off is at the core of so much economic analysis of of welfare programming is that not kind of a big part of of the question that we should be asking of UBI. Yeah, I think so. But I think the, the I would reframe that question too. It's not just about incentives for labor. We know what they do in for poor people, right? I think you need to know what happens to the incentives of labor across the income spectrum, right? It's universal. I think that's one piece. The other piece is, I mean, 
I don't know why we perceive some reduction in labor supply to be a bad thing, right? Um, I think my labor supply could use a reduction um, and it might be a good thing, not just for me, but for the world around me. Um, but for some reason, we think that's a really bad thing. Now, of course, if everybody stopped working completely, that's a different thing because then the UBI becomes a very different conversation because anymore I have to give you all your income, right? But I, I don't know that I, it's a, it's certainly a normative judgment that people have made that, you know, a, a labor where if your income goes up and you work a less, some less hours is a bad thing. I don't know why that's the normative conclusion that it's a bad thing. Uh, I think it's because of some of the press, like the, you know, the recipient who stays home and doesn't do anything. That's a different thing. But on the margin, I don't, I don't think I have a normative reason to believe that's a bad thing, right? We ask ourselves both, what sort of effects do we see? Do we see extensive margin effects? Do you pull out of employee? Do you see intensive margin effects? And how do we think about both of those pieces and what that implies of, a, of what basic becomes, right? If I'm seeing marginal changes in the labor, I'm okay with that. If I'm seeing people exit wholly, it means that the basic piece will have to go up in the future. And now it creates a little set of people who can lobby for this, right? So now I'm giving it to everybody. They can all go lobby for high this. And then we start to get into, I think, a bit of dynamic incentive side. But I don't think we know the answers to those questions yet. Where does the incentives kick in? At what level of income? Is it extensive, intensive margins? And, and where do they hit? And I, I know for sort of cash transfers to poor people, there's really no big labor supply effects. If anything, they're positive. Um, we know from our work, Paul, <laughs> as well, right? And so I think the question is, you know, where do we see them in the income situation? How big are they? Are they extensive margin, intensive margin? Until we know those answers, I think it's going to be hard to know what the true incentive will be from something universal. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. James or Leonard, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, maybe two quick points. I think the first one is that we have to make sure that um, universal is implemented accounting for externalities. You know, like for instance, it cannot be like we are going to reach every single individual but we can actually design program in such a way that those who are rich can actually help and influence others, you know, in a way, it, 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 so, 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 so what I'm saying that you can compensate for the limitations of universality by leveraging externalities, by also giving more weight to agency, you know, like, people not just get the money and run away, they actually do something with it that can benefit others, you know? And, and then at the second point I would like to maybe raise very quickly is also that we have to make sure, I mean, I like these kind of programs, like for instance, the one that you mentioned, which is give directly, you know, um, it, it's very important, but then we also have to keep in mind that states, I mean, sustainability needs state capacity, you know, we, government has to be part of a solution, you know, it cannot be bypassing government, it has to be, you know, so, 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 so implementing project like, project like yours, for instance, might, might be like, how do we decentralize properly? How do we um, find a way to get the right people to show up at the door so that they receive, you know, so it, it's a, it's a mechanic design problem that may have it that should have a solution so anyway so so you know i think i very much like um you know like um uh, you know tamnit's uh, caveats and comments but i think it just pushes us to actually think more practically about how we get there you know great uh, one is externalities the other one is state capacity yeah great great thank you Jim, let me ask you one question, um, and, and as well, feel free to react to anything that's been said, and then um, we'll move to the audience. I think Karthik has a question, and, and if others would like to, please uh, please uh, make a note in the chat, um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, Jim, I wanted to ask um, if you would um, look ahead a little bit, 
um, you know, in parallel to the work that you've been doing on the evolving uh, politics of income distribution, you know, many of us have been reading work by Thomas Piketty and co-authors. Um, they've also been chronicling the evolution of income and wealth distributions. Um, they also put a lot of emphasis on uh, the politics of income distribution and not just on technical change. Um, but they sound a bit of an ominous note, right, in the sense that Piketty looks back and says, if you look at the major changes to the politics of income distribution in a lot of countries, um, they've come at times of conflict, um, at times of significant disruption. Um, so, for example, the World Wars, the Great Depression. And so what I'm wondering, um, if we ask you to, uh, to look ahead a little bit, which I know is uh, hard for all of us, um, even in the, uh, the empirical social sciences, but if you look ahead a bit and sort of think about the cases you've chronicled and tell us, you know, based on what you've seen, do you also anticipate that big changes like this would come through uh, significant disruption, or do you see the trailheads of paths to, um, to less disruptive change? Uh, sorry, it's a hard question to answer. Um, what, what strikes me is the, what you could call the methodological nationalism of the whole discussion, is when we talk about e equality and whether equality is greater or lesser equality, that it's, it's always in France or in the United States, or the, the world is, is composed of, of a, an array of these entities which have their own properties and their own measurable characteristics. Um, uh, there's a very basic issue of which places actually have kept the accounts that we need to be able to do our quantitative work, which well, that's you know, right too. restricts yes, you to a, a very small subset of places, right? You go to the places that have the record keeping to yes. allow you to make yes. your argument, and you're making an argument about those places. You're yes. not making an argument about the world. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think if you were to try to look at, at the global view, um, you would see, in fact, some real reductions in inequality in recent decades. Um, as you've probably all seen Branko Milanovic's um, presentations about the, the elephant, right? The, 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 the point is there's a huge surge in, in people in middle income countries, largely China, but not just China, um, who have gone from being dirt poor to make middle class kind of, kind of livings. And there's been a corresponding uh, erosion of the old um, first world middle class um, positions, which now look closer to those of the, of the people in the so-called middle-income countries. Um, and I think that a big question here is not so much about the U.S. or about France. Maybe it's about that gigantic global middle that's out there. We don't know what's going to become of it. Um, and I, what, what strikes me in the context of our discussion is that it's from those middle-income countries that we've seen the real new developments in systems of social protection and especially schemes of cash transfer. Right? All these cash transfer schemes come out of, that, you know, they come out of Brazil, they come out of uh, Mexico, they come out of uh, South Asia. There's, um, there's, I think, I don't know if we can make predictions about whether we will have more or less uh, in, in the way of inequality uh, versus, versus distribution. Um, but I think we can say that there are probably new ideas and new practices that are being incubated in these middle-income countries. Uh, they, they, I, my, my gut feeling is that's where the action is, right? The, the action isn't here, it's not in France. It's in these middle-income countries that are figuring out new rules of the game um, as we speak. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, let's go then to the audience. Um, Karthik, I know had a question. Others, please feel free um, to uh, make a note in the chat if you'd like me to call on you. And um, please direct your question to one of our panelists, but then as before, we'll, we'll open it up for anyone else to add if they'd like. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I'm outdoors. There may be some wind. Uh, so I had a quick comment to Leonard and then a couple of questions to James. So the comment to Leonard, I think I'll say, you know, I, I find one of the most useful ways of thinking about cash transfers and the portfolio of what we spend money on is, you know, Paul's own framing of thinking about, you know, the basic income or income transfers as an index fund for development spending, right? So if you, if the public good, if you're truly providing public goods, then you should do that rather than the income transfers because, you know, the alpha is greater than one. But what we see is that there's so much value destruction in government spending that what kind of reaches people is so much less than what is spent that just tactically within that, you know, there's kind of a strong case, uh, you know, for including the income transfers as part of the portfolio of what we do. So that's just a comment. I think, James, I have two, uh, you know, big questions. The first is just, you know, 
you 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 made your comments mainly on kind of ethical and moral first principles, and I think part of Leonard's pushback was not kind of um, bringing the politics in. So, but bringing politics in, given that you know we need to find ways of making this politically palatable to the taxpaying class, right? Uh, and going back to the Piketty reference, Tom um, Paul was making, you know, why not kind of have a more specific set of recommendations around intergenerational trends? You know, so it's not like very high income taxes, but make a stronger moral case for wealth taxes, given that there is a genetic lottery that is well documented. And that way you kind of sidestep this problem about the incentives for people to work in their lifetimes, which is still motivated a fair bit, yet, you know, by the sense that you keep what you earn, but kind of create the, the budgetary space for this through kind of more um, aggressive advocacy of, of wealth taxes. So that's one question. The second is, I think, mm, you know, you make, I think, a, a compelling case for national borders being somewhat arbitrary in this world of, of movement and migration. But that's something where I just don't see, right, how we move away from the construct of the nation state in terms of these imagined communities that, again, uh, Leonard was alluding to, right? The presence and the neighbor is very different, like, you know, from, uh, so unless you're talking about completely remaking the human imagination to go beyond the nation state, I don't see, the, is there a pathway you're taking us towards to kind of how one even has that conversation? at a global level. Yes, um, okay, let me, let me be, try to be brief. Um, I, I think I've been misunderstood as, as having delivered a paper that was principally based on my own ethical and moral uh, uh, preferences. I have ethical and moral preferences like everyone, but that's not the point of the paper. Um, I talk about that Kropotkin conception of the, the, whole, the whole productive apparatus belonging to uh, being owned by, by the, the human society as a whole, uh, not because I like it, but because I found it in, in almost exactly the same forms in, in Namibia, in the basic income grant campaign. I found people making this argument about ownership, saying, why should we get grants? We should get grants because we're the, we're, as the nation, we're the owner of all this wealth. And as a co-owners, we're entitled to get a share. I thought that was very interesting. And, and so I'm trying to track what are some of the kinds of arguments people are making that are not labor-based, that are not saying, look, we work in those mines, we're entitled to a share. These, these are arguments made, being made by people who've never worked in the mine a day in their lives, but who still think that they're entitled to, to some of the revenue that they produce. Um, so I hope, I hope that, that uh, was, was clear in the end. Um, if, if I found Mibians making arguments in favor of wealth taxes, I would have done a lot more thinking about wealth taxes, but that, that's not the argument they're making. And, and as an anthropologist, I'm, you know, I'm uh, first of all, documenting what I find, uh, not saying what I think I should have found. Um, on on the, um, the, the non-national kinds of, of bases for, uh, for distribution, uh, I agree that that's going against the current, right? We've for so long thought about society as intrinsically the nation state. That's what society is, right? It's just sort of uh, this, this common sense. In spite of the fact that we more and more live in a world where huge number, I mean, in some countries, a majority of the population are not members of the nation, right? You go to, go to the Persian Gulf and, you know, the, uh, we, we're more and more living in a world where that construct simply can't carry the weight that we've asked it to carry. Um, and I think it's not, again, it's not just something that I'm asserting. I'm, I'm observing the way state services are delivered. And I'm finding that there's a lot of attention to the fact that state services for practical reasons, like COVID vaccinations, right? Are we gonna give COVID vaccinations just to the citizens or to whoever's here? Well, you'd be an idiot to only give it to the citizens because you're gonna kill citizens by allowing it to spread among, among non-citizen groups, right? There's a lot of state service delivery that works according to that logic, that, because societies work according to that logic. Societies work according to the logic of who lives adjacent to, butting up against, interacting with each other. And whether or not they have passports um, is, is practically speaking often not a very important question. Thank you, James. We have time for one more. And so uh, I'm gonna invite uh, Sid Siddharth George to pose his question and then we'll wrap. Um, hi, James. Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, very um, enlightening lecture. Um, my question is about whether we can um, expect uh, norms about who is deserving um, to change as a result of uh, universal programs in a relatively short period of time, given that these norms sort of reflect um, longer historical processes? And is there 
is there anything we can learn about um, you know the ex historical experience of rich countries, the introduction of the welfare state, uh, about you know um, about how that um, those social norm changes occur? Uh, thank you. Yes, that that's a really big and important question um, because. Um, some of these ideas about who does or doesn't deserve a share of production um, may be in some sense out of date. It may be in some sense non-functional, but that doesn't make them go away, right? That's not, that's not the way human societies work. We don't give up on our values just because some analysis has shown that they're out of date. Um, and something that's, that always strikes me in South Africa is how strong this attachment to the ideal of labor is. The idea that this is really, especially for men, right? The really fundamental thing for a man is to, is to have a job and that's what makes you a man, what makes you fit to be married. It's, it allows you to socially reproduce yourself. It's, it's what makes you deserve to have a place in society. And that, that idea is really, really strong. Um, and at the same time, you look at, there's a whole generation of young men coming up and you've got to look at that and say, where are their jobs, right? There's, there's, there's no scenario where, where in there they all have jobs or even most of them have jobs. Um, but um, it's, it's really powerful. Um, and let's remember, you know, these ideas about labor, it took a couple hundred years to instill them in people, right? They're not gonna disappear overnight. It's gonna be a long drawn out process whereby people change their ideas about deserve things like what, the, the deservingness of, of receiving a share. But you know, I, there, there is some evidence in South Africa that, that, that we, we've got a, a study that shows um, a bunch of people, a bunch of young men, unemployed young men are asked about, what do you think about this thing of the government giving everybody some money every month? Do you think that's a good thing? And they all say, no, terrible, terrible. You can't give somebody something for nothing. It's, it'll make them dependent. It'll make them lazy. They, what they need is jobs. But you have a matched sample of, of people with the same characteristics and you introduce the question a little differently and you say, South Africa generates X number of rand of, of wealth from, from mineral production every year. Some people think that a share of that should be uh, divided up and, and given as direct ca cash benefits uh, to the citizens of South Africa. Do you think that's a good idea? They all say yes. They all say that's great. Mineral dividend, absolutely. Grant, no, that, that makes people lazy. So a lot has to do with how it's framed, how it's understood, right? It's not a question of what are you gonna do with X number of dollars of benefit? It's a question of what is it in the first place, that thing that you've received? Um, how do you understand it? What is it? What is it that you've received and why have you received it, right? Is it a gift? Is it because somebody feels sorry for you? Is it because you failed as a man? Or is it because you're not a nobody, but you're an owner and you, your ownership rights have been uh, uh, ignored and, and deprived and, and you've been deprived of them illegitimately for many years and you've got something coming by right, right? So I think those, those kinds of shifts, and we, to see them, we need to pay attention to, to meanings. And this is maybe my anthropological uh, sort, of, sort of training. That it's not just a question of understanding a, a quantum of material uh, buying power that's being moved from one account to another. It's, we have to get at that question of socially, what, what is the significance of these payments? What are they understood to do socially? That's, can I just jump in and say there's all cognitive neuroscientists working on preferences for reading and the cognitive updating that happens as social situations change and how it affects your preferences for redistribution. I know it's another field, but since this is interdisciplinary, I thought I would mention it. And kind of trying to link cognitive paths and how those change in different situations to your preferences for redistribution. Um, not in the developing world yet, because their labs have to that, but I think that would be an interesting set of work to link back to this and link back to exactly your questions. How do, how do our paths change and evolve as these programs and situations? And so I think we've got, we can learn a bunch from them too. I like it. I, I nominate it to Tom for a future PACTEV keynote. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Um, let's wrap there. I want to thank the you. The woman who time. does this is amazing, by the way. She, she's yeah. amazing. Okay, good. So. I'm excited.
Um, let's stop there and let's thank uh, our panelists and our speaker, James, very much. We're really grateful to you all for spending the time here and for your thoughtfulness. Um, I appreciate it. And I'll hand it back over to uh, Tom to lead us on into the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Yeah, super.